Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in 2015 in Alberta, Canada, there was a series of events that were so shocking, the only explanation was that the red fella downstairs made him do it. This was in a small town in like the most remote of, of wilderness. The first was for practice, the other two were unspeakable. Let's give it a go. This whole video takes us to Blair and it gave me some more of it, Alberta. That's, that's, that's Blair Moore. It is in the Crow's Nest Pass municipality, named so because it sits right on this little pass between the mountains of Alberta and British Columbia. It's a mining town, you know, the Springsteen songs, and it's pretty diverse, you know, people coming from all over to get the pickaxe out. Now though, it's, it's way more well known for, you know, it's scenic beauty, it's hiking, fishing, mountain biking, all that. Something the 1500 residents of Blairmore and the area, you know, they all depend on. Lest they join the ever-growing number of ghost towns that surround. Working hard to avoid joining any of those was 27-year-old Terry Blanchette. Terry worked as a cook at Pure Country Bar and Grill in Frank, which was the next town over, and he was all about his little girl, two-year-old Haley. She was, you know, the absolute light of his life. Terry had like a minor, small criminal history, uh, assault and theft, but when his daughter Haley was born in 2013, he, he decided to turn it all around and he wanted to start fresh. Haley's mother was Cheyenne Dunbar, and you know, they'd all like been together when Haley was born, but a couple of months later they broke up, she would move to Edmonton. But they, they would split custody of Haley, you know, they, they split up, but it was a very amicable uh, separation. They both, you know, just wanted to do the best for their little girl. They talked often, you know, they would send each other pictures all the time, and they would describe each other as great parents. Haley, great kid, happy-go-lucky and close with her grandparents, Terry's parents too. Life wasn't easy, you know, things were hard, but they were happy. So what's the little hardship, you know, in the face of happiness? On the 14th of September, 2015, Terry's father, uh, William Blanchett, he was traveling from his home in Elkford, British Columbia to Calgary, Alberta. And that little road trip would take him right through Crow's Nest and Blairmore. So that day he was, he was, he was, I'll stop in. I'll stop into my son and my granddaughter will grab lunch. He arrived, you know, at the 14th that morning, knocked on Terry's door to no answer. Nothing. He went back to his car, half 10, it was like half 10 a.m., texted his son, hey, are you up? No response. So he was thinking, all right, here, listen, I need to get, I need to get fuel. He drove his truck over to, to the nearest um, gas station, topped it up, and then tried calling Terry again to once again, no answer. So then he drove back to Terry's house, and this time he's thinking, okay, maybe my son's phone is dead, right? So he went inside. He walked in, and the house was absolutely dead quiet. He was expecting to hear the TV, the sounds of a two-year-old, but instead it was just eerie silence. And as he walked through the house, he started noticing things were off, messes. A few bits and bobs had been like knocked over. And as he was walking down the hallway, he just managed to glance in to the bathroom. And it was in there he saw something on the floor. There he saw his son Terry lying in a pool of blood, partially covered up with a blanket. And there was absolutely no sign of Haley in the house. He then called the RCMP. Terry had head injuries and a large cut from one side of his neck to the other. There were blood stains in his bedroom, leading the police to believe that that's where it all began. And then Terry had been dragged into the bathroom. But where was Haley? There was there was blood smears on the door leading into her bedroom, on her blanket, on her doll, in her crib. Just not her. At 3:30 a.m. the night before, the fellow who lived out back, you know, the house behind Terry's, he'd been awoken in the middle of the night to hearing some strange. Sounds, you know, someone snooping around, you know, creeping around. Somebody up to some creepy shit. A white van was also seen on CCTV in the area that night, but other, you know, it was a white van. White van, what else he got? You know, it, it did have a large antenna and a flag on the antenna, but there wasn't much else to go on other than B 
be on the lookout for a white van. Good evening. We begin with breaking news from Blairmore in southern Alberta. Already the scene today of an Amber Alert. Police now tell us a father has been murdered. This is two-year-old Haley Dunbar Blanchett. Police across our province and in B.C., Saskatchewan, and now Montana are on the lookout for her tonight. And they're asking you to be on the lookout too. An Amber Alert was swiftly put out to try and find the missing child. This, this was terrifying. Someone had broken into a house in the middle of the night and... Goddamn some bitch. The Amber Alert was put out, you know, for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana, if anybody saw Haley. The RCMP were worried that whoever kidnapped her might try and escape into the United States. This Amber Alert was later then updated to include the description of the white van with the antenna. Everywhere this was. The community were up and at them almost immediately because, get this, fear and uncertainty were pretty rife in the community at this particular time, less than a week before this horrific murder and kidnapping, there had been another murder in this community. 69 next year old Hannah Mekatek, another resident of Coleman, which is just, you know, a couple of minutes down the road, she had been found murdered in her trailer. She was a very caring, you know, loving woman. And I mean, I guess it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, you know, this sort of stuff doesn't happen in Crow's Nest. She was found in her home uh, September 9th after a neighbor requested a welfare check to be done on her. She was found in her bedroom. Uh, she'd put up, somebody had broken in. The door showed signs of being forced open. Uh, she, there were signs of a struggle that she'd fought whoever broken in. Her skull had been caved in with like an item, like a, a pipe or a baseball bat. And then her throat had been cut open. Almost the exact same thing as what had happened to Terry. Questions about this then began immediately. There was any, you know, ooh, link between the two, but the police were quick to dismiss, you know, any connection. The searches were on. Locals, neighbors, air units, roadblocks, Cheyenne, of course, rushed to Crow's Nest to find her daughter. The crime scene was processed, and luminol was used, and it located footprints. Bloodied footprints leading away from the house. Then, likely into that white van, and off it went. Vigils were done, and calls were made that might be useful to the police, especially regarding that white van. And speaking of disappearing, that's not my, not my best transition, this whole video is sponsored by Aura. What's that? I'm a hacker who's all your information? Thank you. Uh-oh, Aura's here. Party's over, guys. Aura Big Dogs is an app designed to keep you safe online, preventing identity theft. Aura protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the deep web, the dark web, the web in your pants into places your private information can be sold to the bad guys. Scammers and those darn dirty hackers, they will get your email addresses, your per private information, your social security number, your socks, if and when they can get them. Aura has a goo, looks for your information and lets you know if it finds it. And let's be honest, it probably will. It's happened to me. I've been recommended to change a number of my passwords, which I did, so joke's on you, hackers. Aura will automatically request removals of your details, and it also has a whole host of other features. I'm talking a VPN, real-time alerts of suspicious credit inquiries, malware and virus detection, and password managers. It does it all. Let Aura do the hard all work of keeping you safe online, and you can sign up to Aura right now using my special link. It'll give you a two-week free trial. That is Aura.com slash that chapter. It's got a hell of a high rating, so you know they'll look after you. So once again, go to Aura.com slash that chapter and be absolutely terrified by how much of your information is out there on the web. But don't worry, Aura's got your back, my friends. Now, speaking of back, let's get back into it. If you needed something cleaned and you wanted it done with prestige, you might contact, you know, in the bustling heart of downtown Blairmore prestige cleaners. When you need timely dry cleaning services or custom clothing alterations and repairs, come into Prestige Cleaners and Tailors in downtown Blairmore. Prestige Cleaners was a family business owned by none other than the Zaretskis for over 47 years. That was started by parents Nick and Tina, and now their grown-up sons, Kevin and Larry, owned it. Maybe it would even pass to the next generation. Larry, he had a 22-year-old son named Derek Zaretsky, and he, well, he had worked there for a couple of months, but really didn't seem too keen on 
diving into, you know, cleaning. And it was Larry Zaretsky who, you know, after hearing about this, the Amber learned the horrific disappearance that had just happened, horrific murder and disappearance that just happened right down the road. He called the police. Prestige cleaners used those white vans with the antennas and the flags. They had three of them. One of those white vans had been taken without permission sometime between September 13th and September 14th, the night of the murder. Now, by whom? You know, the family didn't know, but, you know, it was a work van. It had last been used on September uh, 11th, and then, you know, it, somebody had used it. They, they didn't know, and none of the employees knew who had used it, but it wasn't where it had been left, where it had been left parked, and the odometer had a couple of extra miles on it. So he phoned this in, and the police said it will be right over. So who had used it? And had it been used, what you thinking for? While awaiting the cops, Larry's son Derek just happened to stroll into the cleaners, and, and Larry noticed his son was a little bit off. Like he wanted to talk about something. He was, you know, odd. Larry said, what's the crack with you? Do you know anything about this missing murder stuff that's going on that just happened down the road? Derek replied, Haley is in heaven now. He then became incoherent and started talking gibberish. The police arrived, and Derek repeated what he had said to his dad to the police, and he was arrested. Just to let you know, Derek, that you have been identified as a, as a suspect, okay? Your Haley's disappeared, and Terry's death. Yeah, I get it. Okay, you know what happened to Haley? I feel comfortable saying that. Let's start with, is she alive? Uh, is there a possibility she's still alive? Possibility, I guess. Derek, this is a this is a serious, serious investigation here. Someone's been killed, someone's been murdered, and we have a two-year-old that we have to find. Jesus. Yeah. The police did a search of the van that had been missing. And guess what? Blood was found inside. Showed clear as day because it was blue and that's how everybody was feeling and floor mats inside the van were missing also. The police immediately then searched Derek's apartment hoping you're know, praying to find Haley that he had been the one kidnapped her, that, that she was alive. Derek lived right next door to the cleaners so they didn't have to go far. While searching his place, which quite frankly looked like a serial killer's home, they found blood on a doorknob, droplets in the living room, and latex gloves and boots which appeared to have blood on them. They found a hammer, a hatchet, and books on cannibalism. He even wrote on his own table, one shot, one kill, and this is not the end, death is only the beginning. They also found a notebook in his apartment which read, Hannah, sleepers for the dogs, Hannah had dogs. Shy, Terry, the hideous baby. I'm not asking if you did it. I didn't do it, so I'm I can't not... tell you where she is. Because I didn't do any of it. I didn't do any of it. The investigators aren't just guessing. That's you, right? You do realize that, right? Their case is very strong. I don't know. I didn't do it. Initially, he denied any involvement. But after, you know, a couple of hours of questioning, it became pretty apparent they were not going to find Haley alive. She needs to come home. Where is she, buddy? There. Where is she? The devil made me turn her to ashes. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay. Is it in the bush where you burnt her? Is that where she died? Yeah, How'd you kill her? I choked her. Okay. Just like he choked me. Yeah. <laughs> Did she suffer? A little bit. A little bit? He told me to save myself. For my own. He said I had to teach them the soul solution. He said killing her would save you? Ah, the good old devil made him do it. This fucking guy. Is the devil in the room with us right now? Should we fuck him up? Not far from down, down Blairmore lies a 160-acre uh, property out in the countryside. What's called the ranch. 
It's owned by three sisters, they all, they all share it. And one of those sisters is named Carmela Soretsky, and she is married to Kevin Soretsky. So she's married to Derek's uncle. Carmela has a son named Shane, who would be, you know, Derek's cousin. And on the 13th of September, he was at the ranch. He was there, and when he was leaving, he was making sure the fire pit, you know, was completely empty, it wasn't smoldering or anything, and there was no, like, foreign objects inside. He returned two days later, on the 15th uh, of, of September. Now, he had heard all about, you know, the horrific events at, at the Blanchette home, and the Amber Alert, and all, everything like that. Now, he was back at the ranch because he had just forgotten some stuff when he'd been there a couple of days earlier, so he's back to, to collect. And while he was on the property, he noticed smoke coming from the fire pit. It had been used since he had left, and he didn't know anybody else had been here. So he walked over, and he, and he looked inside, and it was still it was still smoldering. And then he kind of, you know, with a stick, and he saw small bones. He was pretty sure they weren't in there when he left. He called the police immediately, and he led them to the fire pit. A lot of evidence was uncovered, and when confronted with this, Derek would lead them back and reenact what had happened. Left on 129 Street? Um, yeah. I don't know, I just seen the fire pit was there. Yes. Okay, so we'll get out. I'll get your door and stuff. Here. So what? It where did you take Haley? Um, over here. Whereabouts? You just show me, like, just take me right there. No, this was moved. This was moved? This was... Somehow. I don't know where it was. You don't need to move it, but... It's right here. So you had Haley right here? Yeah. Okay, so Boats what did you do? There, yeah. Okay. What did you do first? I started stuck, stuck in the fire pile with books. A bunch of books till I got the fire decently going and put some wood on it. Then I choked her over there. Where? You want to take over me? there. About you just take me to the spot? He's over here. Okay. He told them he had brought Haley, he kidnapped her that night, and he had brought her to the ranch. Then there, he had strangled her with a shoelace. Then he dismembered her. He poured some of her blood into a bottle, and he drank it. And then he ate some of her heart to give him strength. How did you choke her? With the shoelace and string. Where did you get the shoelace? I don't know where I got it from. I just had it in one of the bags. Did you cut her before you choked her to death, or did you cut her? I choked her first. So she was dead when you cut her? Yeah. Okay. She yeah. was terrible. <laughs> I understand, but you're doing a great job, so you should start to feel better. This should be healing for you. Did you... Should be. <laughs> Probably won't be. No. It so will won't get me to where I want to be. It's a start, but it's the first day of the rest of your life. I ate a little bit of her heart. You ate a bit of her heart? To try to strengthen mine. And how did that make you I feel? I drank a bit of her blood to try to give strength in me. And how did that make you feel? A little bit stronger. Yeah. Well, maybe it gave you the strength to tell the truth to you. It did make me strong. It did? For a bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> he then burned her remains in the fire pits. After that, he went home and he smoked a gibber. Derek was charged with the murders of Haley and Terry. As for what kind of person Derek was, no one really had much to say kept to himself, came from a good family, described as a quiet and a decent kid, had some run-ins with the police for burglary, but nothing major. When he was arrested, everyone was simply shocked. I don't know why anybody would do that to her. 
Police say they are still looking for evidence to answer why two counts of first degree murder and another disturbing charge. Mr. Suretsky also faces one count of indignity to a human body in relation to Haley's death. Months later, while being interviewed, he admitted he had also murdered Hannah. He was always on the suspect list uh, for that one. I mean, her name was found in a notebook in his house, and he was neighbors with her, for God's sake. Like, he mowed her lawn all the time. As for motive, I mean, a motive of being other than him being an absolute nutbar psychopath, he said that he had he had, had feelings for Shane Dunbar, Terry's ex, Haley's mother. When he broke into the Blanchett home that night, he didn't know uh, Shane didn't live there anymore. He thought she did. He didn't realize she, you know they'd broken up months ago and she was now living in Edmonton. So wow, you know I hear you're barking, big dog. Was this you know a love triangle, a tale of jealousy, something, something? Derek claimed they dated. Had they? The short answer, and really the only answer, is no. Cheyenne would take the stand at trial saying yes, they'd become friends shortly after the birth of Haley. They'd hung out a couple of times. That was it. Never romantic. They were friends for like five months. They'd hang out from time to time. That was it. Derek clearly felt differently about it though. In fact, he would say the motive for murdering Terry Blanchett was that he believed Terry was abusive to Cheyenne. And he also said Terry gave him a dirty look one time and whew, I did not like that at all. He believed Haley, you know, two-year-old Haley was, well, he saw pictures of Haley on social media, and he believed in those pictures she looked unhappy living with her dad. So, to Derek's mind, she would be better off dead. Uh, Hannah, she was killed simply for practice. That's what Derek said. He said uh, he didn't believe she would be missed. So, you know, may as well have a trial run beforehand. She didn't think she would be missed. The beloved grandmother. Why did you pick her? In custody, Derek tried to take his own life and had to be placed into a medically induced coma, but he would make a full recovery. He would later be rushed to hospital again after starving himself. He was ultimately determined competent to stand trial. In June of 2017, Derek Soretsky was found guilty on three counts of first degree murder. Derek Soretsky was, in August 2017, sentenced to 75 years without parole for the murders of Hannah Mekitek, Terry Blanchett, and Haley Dunbar Blanchett. Derek showed no emotion at sentencing. It was one of Canada's strongest sentences. And there you go. A, a, a story, you know, a, a tale of a tragic and terrifying man who, you know, committed like a completely unspeakable crime against you know the most innocent of us and kind of just like everybody around him. You know, people staying in their home thinking they're safe. Guess what? No. Sick bastard this whole devil made me do it shite. He's in the only place he should be right now. Locked away without a key. <laughs> Fuck. Plenty of time to hang out with your pal in there. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, you guys are great. It really means the world to me. Um, the next old video, it'll be up in a couple of days. So please uh, check that out and look forward to that. And also, you know, check out Twitter, Instagram, that underscore chapter from both. And check out the Patreon for early access to videos and exclusive videos. And also the podcast where I'm telling a whole load of also exclusive stories there. So give it a goo. But until, you know, the next one, um, look after each other and yourselves. Because I love you. Mike, yeah.